Food is a cornerstone of our families, our communities, and our country. And it's something that's on all of our minds right now. But with all of the uncertainty in the world, Canadian food is one thing we can be certain about. Thanks to you, all of you, from those who produce, to those who process, to those who get it on our plate. Canadians never shy away from a challenge. We always answer the call. Every Canadian has a role to play, and ours remains unchanged, providing safe, healthy food to Canada and the world. Food has always mattered to Canadians, but never has it mattered more. And even in times where the distance feels greater, food still brings us together. Thank you for your service. Well, hello and Happy New Year. I'm Kevin Stewart and uh, welcome to Farm Transition, Turning Roadblocks into Building Blocks. We are looking to start off this new year with a fresh mindset toward our challenges. And we're gonna do this with a celebration of sorts uh, as today is Farm Transition Appreciation Day. So before we get too far into all of this, I do want to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you today from the traditional lands of, of four really unique groups of people, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, the uh, Anishinaabek, and the Attawandaran groups. Uh, this land here continues to be the home to diverse in, Indigenous peoples uh, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of this great land of ours. If you have joined us in the past for these FCC virtual events, you'll notice that today is, well, it's a little bit different. Maggie Van Camp from BDO and Patty Duran from FCC are going to take us on a bit of a journey to help us reset our mindset uh, and turn the, the roadblocks of life into building blocks. Today's focus is on developing I would say some clarity about why you are committed to transition, how you do it, including how to change your habits, even change your focus during times of disruption. So there really is a great deal to gain from taking the time to plan together. So we are hoping to- Excuse me, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin, sorry yes. to interrupt. Hi. Uh, we, yeah. we have a bit of a problem that I, I think you should see something. Uh, okay, sure. Fire away. <laughs> hey, Patty, I'm running late. I had a barn alarm go off and uh, I will be there as soon as I can. Um, it's sort of funny, like just like transition planning. You know, the farm stuff always keeps getting in the way. Talk soon. Hey, Maggie, just want to give you a bit of a heads up. I... Uh, I should know better than trying to take a shortcut, but I was running late, thought I would see if I could uh, cut some minutes off the drive, but I'm going to be late for the event. Um, bit of a turkey trail, it like, brought me down, and I'll be there as quick as I can. Hey, Patty, it's Maggie. Just uh, waiting here, uh, hoping that you'll give me a call with some of the directions. I actually went down the road, but now I realized I don't have the address to put in the GPS where we're going, uh, where we're meeting. So can you give me a call back, please? really think that we should get that sorted out ahead of time. Talk soon. Hey, Maggie, you know what? Honestly, kind of glad to hear that you've been delayed too. Uh, my road trip is not getting better. Uh, what was a road uh, kind of doesn't go anywhere. So don't worry, I'll get rerouted. I'll get back on track. I'll see you soon. Patty, they're doing construction on my road, so I'm held up again. I'm so sorry. There's always something, isn't there? Uh, I'm sorry. I will get there, and we can talk all we can about transition planning. But, uh, you know, sometimes you have to just take a detour. Dear me. Well, uh, yeah, I guess it didn't say anywhere in the pre-planning notes that uh, our specialists here today were directionally challenged. So, anyway... Hopefully, they'll find their way here uh, shortly. I know them both, and so uh, I'm confident that Patty and Maggie will find their way here, whether it's Uber or something else. So while we're waiting for them to show up, uh, just a quick FYI, Farm Transition Appreciation Day, as I mentioned a few moments ago, it's an opportunity for all of us in the industry to encourage each other to start planning 
for change. And it's also quite frankly, just to celebrate all that is great about our farms, about our families, and quite frankly, what an accomplishment it is to run and succeed a farm business. When you, when you think about it, some of the longest running businesses in this country are actually farms. So whether your farm has gone through one generation or a dozen, uh, take a moment today to share your family's story online and social media, and just use the has hashtag uh, FTA day, FTA day. So um, is there any sign of our, uh, <laughs> our, our wayward travelers? <laughs> I think <laughs> it's best I can, it's like tracking Santa Claus actually on Christmas Eve to try to uh, find you guys here. But I, I think the Eagles have landed. If, uh, is that about right, guys? <laughs> here we are. I think, I think they are there. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad you guys could make it here. I just, I just quickly want to introduce uh, Maggie Van Camp to everybody. She's a trusted voice in the ag industry. Uh, she is BDO's national ag uh, practice development leader as well as she's quite uh, well known uh, formerly as a journalist. In 2021 of interest, Maggie was actually recognized by the Canadian Western Agrovision as one of the top 50 in Canadian agriculture. Patty Durand, who's uh, joined us before on this program, is a business advisor at FCC and is focused on ag business families and communication and their transition planning. So let's welcome uh, these two ladies here. Boy, I tell you, you know, you, you kind of had me worried. I thought I was going to be doing karaoke or something on my own. So glad you made it. <laughs> Best laid plans, Kevin. Thank you yeah. for that kind introduction. <laughs> Hi, Maggie. It's great to Hi, see you. Hi, Patty. Nice to see you. You made it. <laughs> oh, hello, everyone from coast to coast. We are really excited today to introduce you to three Canadian farmers who are at various stages along their transition journey. Uh, all of them have encountered roadblocks, but through time and patience and persistence, they have been able to overcome them. In fact, they would say that overcoming those roadblocks, the process of doing that actually made them stronger, their family stronger, and their farm stronger and more resilient and ready for the future. And we know that succession planning and even succession creates profitability in farms. It's research to call it the succession effect. And they often chalk it up to, you know, investments, new technologies, these kind of things. But I really believe it's the people power behind it that matters. And working through some of these roadblocks builds skills for the new generation. Things like human resources development, things like financial knowledge, leadership skills, things that our next generation are going to need desperately to be successful in the future. So roadblocks can really be learning blocks. They're super tough when you're in them though. And I encourage everyone just to keep going <laughs> because like many challenges, um, the harder it is, the more you learn from it. Well said. Power in the process, you know, Patty. So before we get into all of that, let's just have you, if you would, Patty, just clearly tell us the difference and create some clarity between farm succession farm transition and estate planning? It's a great question. And honestly, I would say that those three kind of terms get used interchangeably um, often. But if we want to start with estate planning, ultimately, what is the game plan for the distribution of your stuff at your passing? So at its simplest terms. And I would argue for a long time, that was the transition plan. People didn't live as long and the transition of their farm assets and the tools of the business happened when they passed away. As times have changed, as values have changed, as people are living longer and more generations are involved on single farms, we've really shifted to think about farm succession and farm transition. I would say those two terms are fairly interchangeable, but succession seemed to be a bit of a, a trigger for some people because it signified that they were getting pushed out. Succession is about you being replaced. And instead, by calling it farm transition, it's about a process over time, a slow passing of the baton of assets, leadership, and management. Well, we talked about transition being like a journey, you know, that cliche 
journey word. Well, we, we started go, goofing around, Patty, and I started talking. It's more like a road trip or a crop tour. <laughs> and I think Patty started writing down a bunch of fun analogies uh, in her on her whiteboards. I think she got three whiteboards full. And today we thought it might be fun to share Patty and Maggie's list of top six reasons why transition on a farm is similar to a road trip. Perfect. I'll start off. Number six. Sometimes when you're doing farm transition, just like a road trip, you have a clear destination in mind. And other times you just wing it and take your chances. Sometimes you plan it yourself. You plan yourself where you're going. And sometimes you get halfway down the road on the way to the airport and you realize, oh, I should have had somebody else help me do this. <laughs> Number four, another layer. Sometimes farm transition, just like a road trip, is so complex, you probably need a Sherpa to navigate those steep inclines and the unknown parts. Number three is sometimes farm transition is like driving on the 401. You actually don't know how long it's going to take you to get there around that wonderful city of Toronto. It could be three hours. It could be, it could be six hours. You just don't know. And there are a lot of crazy drivers on the 401. So you just hold on and put the GPS in and keep going towards succession. So my personal favorite, this is number two. In farm transition, just like a road trip, you get to decide who comes on the trip. Uh, who's going to be in the car? Who's in the back seat? Who's driving the car? And who's strapped to the roof coming against their will? Patty, I think you should have also taken note of that. Maybe don't yell shotgun when it's a farm trip. <laughs> that entirely different meaning. <laughs> And number one, the number one reason that transition is like a road trip is because sometimes you hit roadblocks. Sometimes there's things to get through that you just didn't expect. And always the most trips are more fun with the people you have around with you on your trip. So absolutely. So we came up with these ideas. Obviously, it's kind of in jest, but there's a lot of familiarity in terms of planning this trip and this journey of transition. If you can think of other analogies or other suggestions on how farm transition is like a road trip, we'd love you to share it in the chat right now. In all seriousness, Patty, uh, why should farm families actually be interested in the presentation today and the three roadblocks we're going to discuss? Our teams at FCC and BDO have met with thousands of families from coast to coast across our great nation. And as we are doing that, we're seeing common risks and these roadblocks that seem to be holding them back. So today's common roadblocks are ones that we feel pretty much every Canadian farm is vulnerable to. We want to introduce you to some farmers who've encountered the challenges and then been able to work through them or work around them. Our purpose is to highlight opportunities and to manage your risks uh, together with some ideas and tools that you can take home and use yourself. Great. Well, let's get started. Let's jump in the car and get going. Uh, roadblock number one is farm family communication. Now, we often hear that we need to communicate better, uh, but what exactly is that? Today, we're going to hear from Leslie Kelly, who farms with her husband, Matt and her brother Derek um, and they are successors of Evergreen Wood Creek Farms which is a grain farm in Saskatchewan that was started by her dad Garnet. Unfortunately Garnet passed away earlier this year um, but their farm team has set up an amazing communication system among them and uh, we're, it's really a, a story worth sharing. So one of the roadblocks that we encounter on a regular basis with family farms from coast to coast in our country is farm communication and good, bad, too much, too little, and kind of everything in between. 
And so we're really, really lucky today to have uh, a fairly well-known uh, farmer, but it's not necessarily the farmer part that is her identity that is necessarily well-known. So Leslie Kelly is with us today and I'm really, really happy to have you. So thank you. I will just say, if you're interested in learning more about her, because her bio is deep and wide, go to High Heels Canola Fields uh, and search her and uh, you will understand more about her brand. Today, Leslie, hello. Hello, thank you for having me, Patty. Oh, so happy to. Tell us about your farm. Well, I'm Leslie Kelly. I farm with my husband and my brother on a 7,000 acre grain farm just south of Saskatoon, and we grow canola, wheat, and lentils. Excellent. Thank you. And when we think about kind of that farm history, could you give us a bit of a brief history? Because you weren't always on the farm. No, I actually, after university, I had sights on uh, being involved in the marketing world and living in Toronto and Calgary, uh, but my life took a right-hand turn and I worked at uh, ATB Financial and Farm Credit Canada for about uh, 14 years, 15 years in total, and then slowly transitioned just the past few years to be full-time on the farm with my family. Excellent. So how did that journey happen? Uh, it happened very, very slowly. Um, it was when my dad approached both my husband and my, and my brother with the opportunity of being part of the farm. And Matt and I made a short-term sacrifice when we moved back to Saskatchewan, living in Alberta. We moved back uh, to Regina and then he commuted. And then myself, I worked and then a few years ago, made the decision to be full time on the farm just because uh, we had to be living at the farm in order for the farm to grow and succeed. So it was um, a hard decision, but so glad that we did make it. Absolutely. So I've been lucky enough to hear pieces of the journey and we, the theme for this roadblock is communication. So uh, I guess tell us a little bit about, I, I think that um, your family, when I encountered you, I think had some really strong practices already, but that wasn't always the case. No, for us, um, communication definitely wasn't one of our strong suits. And we were, you know, five individuals going in all different directions, had different goals and dreams and aspirations of the farm and what we wanted, you know, for our families to have. And so it wasn't one of our strong suits. But um, when my dad wanted to, he made the made the transition of the farm a priority and with that um, our communication uh, followed suit because we knew that we we didn't we thought that we were good communicators um, but that necessarily wasn't the case when we started to sit down and talk about where we wanted the farm to go and what that looked like. So then on this journey as you're trying to improve communication what were your key lessons? Oh, some of my key lessons looking back now is that we had to make communication a priority. And through that, we really learned that it, uh, we developed it like a muscle um, in the sense that we, we had to make it a priority and we had to learn how to communicate. And so one of the lessons that, you know, reflecting back that really helped us was sitting down and learning what that looked like. How do we become good communicators on the farm? So we developed um, a set of values and cultural principles of how we how we communicate, how we talk, um, how we you know go through conflict together. Um, so that was um, some of the pivotal key moments, key successes on the farm looking back that really helped us during you know those first moments and those hard moments of transition. So I can imagine coming from a corporate background to a farm background, there would be pieces of that. There'd be communication that would be pretty normal for you in your day to day, your day job. But then how did you translate that to the farm? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, here, you know, coming from corporate to a farm where uh, we weren't meeting every week. And I just saw with the team that I was part of how if you can, if you talk, if you talk about the successes and you are able to share those hard moments and those struggles, um, how great and magical things can happen. And just taking some ordinary processes of how it can take your farm team from good 
to great. And really, and then it's working together as a team on the same page, um, and working through those hard things like that, that to me is, it, it's life changing. It's where I, I love to be. And that's like, it's so great to see how our family can do those things together. Nice. So I think you talked about building a muscle and you talked about introducing some structure and, and along those lines. So um, I think you described it as how to communicate. So what did you learn to do as a family? How did you do it? How did we do it? Well, uh, making it a priority, making a set agenda. So carving time out of our schedules, you know, there's so much to do on the farm, but knowing that if we took an hour each week or 15 minutes each day, whatever was on, on our plates or on that list, that we had to carve out that time to sit down. And then it was having an agenda. Uh, an agenda, it could, could be, you know, a, a few major things that we had to talk about or some of the smaller things. But um, knowing that we were all coming together, this was a priority and here were the things that we had to talk about. And then it was also, how do you bring up those hard topics how do you bring up um you know some if you're hurt or if there's been a negative impact um and then we actually had a meeting on how how do you talk about that what are what are the things that you can say that all keep us you know moving forward and develop those strong relationships and we call them repair attempts just like how we fix equipment uh the same goes for our relationships it's um, making those small little fixes, those tweaks, those repairs that help maintain strong relationships. Nice. I think um, you said something uh, that you had shared that your dad said um, that when you're farming, it's not about land and equipment. Mm -hmm. It's about how you take care of each other and yourself. Mm -hmm. What a wise man. That was, I would say, one of the... I thought it changed my perspective of farming, but it really changed my perspective of life. So he shared that quote when it was one of our first transition meetings where we, we sat down and we were all dirt squirrels. I talk about dirt squirrels because we were in the in literally in the dirt trying to think of ways or you know the future of the farm and different goals and aspirations and between the five of us we all had we were going in different directions and my dad said you know out of the 40 of 40 or so crops that I've grown this is what I've learned and it's to take care of each other and ourselves and that really changed my it was a light bulb moment it changed my perspective of everything and really it brought us it brought us together and that's where it really helped us develop our values and our values is family comes first and then farm, and then financials. So through all of our decisions, how we talk, how we communicate, um, it all boils down. The first is how family is so important because I need my family in order for the farm to continue. And it was such a great pivotal moment of really setting that foundation um, for the future. That's awesome. So that then leads to my next question because you also told me a story about sitting on your deck with your family. Yeah, so trying to figure out how to communicate and really develop, you know, our farm farm team. Um, with Matt and I being out in Alberta, my mom and dad at the farm, and my brother just moving back um, to the farm too, we, we needed to learn who we were as people. And if family is one of the important values, um, I didn't know you know, what my parents' fears were, what kept them up at night. I didn't know the world my brother was living in. So we sat down on the deck um, one morning, made a communication a priority to, to learn about each other. And there was no agenda, uh, no phones. And we talked about each other's worlds. And that was another aha, life-changing moment where I got to see my parents and my brother and my husband um, in a different light. And to learn about if the future of the farm, where it's going, we had to learn about the people. And so we shared our fears, our struggles, our worlds, and uh, developed such a, a sense of such a safe environment and a sense of trust of, of each other. Now I know why, you know, my brother is doing this. It's because this is going on in his world. And this is why my dad might be frustrated right now is because this is what's keeping him up at night. And that really sets a new tone um, for the farm. 
So then you built on that and you had a bit of a tool, a bit of a language that you were use as a team on a scale of one to 10. And I, I love this concept. I think a lot of farms might benefit from it. Yeah, it's a simple thing that we do. Um, uh, right now in the winter, we're doing it about once a week. And then in the busy moments during seeding and harv harvest, it's um, once a day. So uh, at the beginning of the day, we each share our number. Uh, with one being low, 10 being high, of uh, where we are in terms of stress. Because if my number is at a three, uh, then my family knows that I might uh, be able to take on more or lend some more support. But then, then I know if my brother or my husband or one of our teammates are at a 12, that we can understand their world more, and then we can pitch in and rally around them to help bring that number down. And there's also just power in in having that conversation and letting, it's the self-awareness. Some days I might think I'm a seven, um, but then when I talk about it, it's like, actually, no, I'm, I'm more at a three or a four. And then that stress, you give it less power just by sharing and by recognizing where you are. And then there's the power of the team behind you to know what each other's numbers are at and then how we can work together. Um, so a simple everyday exercise that has created such good dialogue, conversation, and support on the farm. Well, I love the concept too, because sometimes it's like, I'm at a nine. Is there anything you need? No, I actually need space. That you don't have to explain it. You don't have to draw a picture. You don't have to use words. You can just, it, I just think it's really powerful. And I, I'm really excited that you're willing to share it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, been a great exercise for us. And then um, with that one to 10 number, there's another tool that we use um, and we do it whether in person or on WhatsApp. Um, and it's, you know, we share with the number, sometimes those could be the harder conversations, but we also don't shy away from sharing um, and celebrating the wins and those good moments. And so we take time to reflect on, um, you know, with a simple question as to, you know, today, what are you most proud of? Or what did you accomplish? Or what was a win today? And sometimes my win might be different than their wins. Um, or on a scale where I, I always think, you know, today my win was I uh, understood the, the hand signals or I didn't dump, I didn't dump grain. Um, but to me, that's a huge win. And being able to share it and then have that celebration around it also helps, you know, because we talk about the hard, but we can't forget to talk about the good because there's so much good. Absolutely. So I think it would be remiss to miss out the fact that you did not do this alone. And you've talked about key people that um, helped your family in your communication process. Yeah, we wouldn't um, be where we are today without our team. So there's our family team, but then there's also our advisory team, because we know that um, we're not experts in everything. Um, and we really need different perspectives and different opinions and different ideas and just a different lens of looking at um, things or problem solving and then also just support. So we were very intentional with creating um, a really strong and good and supportive farm team that's helped us um, over, you know, through the last 10 years of our transition and has been such a key, have been key players in helping our farm move forward. That's awesome. So I will just comment, I know that team to be quite broad. So it's everything from, from finance and lending to agronomy and crop inputs um, and, and getting some transition guidance as well. And so um, I think every farm is going to have a little different version of that, but what an opportunity. If you had the ear of every Canadian farmer, what would you say to them about farm family communication? Oh, well, what I say is, uh, you know, we weren't experts but know that you can do this. That on our farm, we took ordinary everyday processes or practices that made extraordinary change on the farm and really set us up for the now and then for, for the future. I think that's a beautiful place to wrap it up. Thank you for this. Thank you, Patty. Take care. What an amazing story that Leslie Kelly has. Their dad set them up for success. I love that, that they have habits and rules 
in which to communicate. I mean, in business, you would have sort of code of conducts and they actually set rules of engagement for each other way better than, you know, a fight in the vineyard type of approach. Like this is makes complete sense. The communication that they set up, I really loved it. They had set up meetings at set up times and that they had agendas ahead of time. I think those are wonderful things. Please share in the chat box any ideas you or your family use. Um, I once had a family talk about having a WhatsApp group for their farm, which they shared all farmer, farm information and a WhatsApp group for their farm family. And they called it Farm Family Fun. <laughs> and so they had, they shared that kind of information there to sort of define the two areas. Um, I personally am going to take away Leslie's uh, one to 10 stress rule and use it for my accountants during tax season. I feel like they'll all be at a 15, Kevin. <laughs> they'll all be right there during April. <laughs> well, that's good insight. Good insight, Maggie, because really there's a lot to learn from that. Especially, I feel so much better about being a dirt squirrel. <laughs> honestly just you know what it's just i feel okay now just about scrounging around there's no style points for this you know <laughs> i tell you some other things yeah go ahead so i think someone in the chat box is also going to share the farm family communication resource page that fcc has created so if anybody's looking for any other ideas about communication please click on that link and it'll give you um, a bunch more ideas Nice, nice. I have to say personally too, what uh, resonates with me and Leslie's discussion is this idea of the repair attempts and, and the fact that she actually said we had to learn how to communicate. I think, I think we all think we know how to do that. You just talk, don't you? And yet this idea of repair attempts where, you know, before you can tackle a big issue uh, or at least a, a financial issue or something, we need to actually sometimes repair a relationship or or an incident that you know is affecting the the team negatively and the reason it resonated with me is because it's a, actually a tactic that we used on our farm and and i use in my media business and so the idea the way we did it was um that we would focus as, as much as possible on attacking issues and not attacking people so whatever the issue is rather than me say you know you make me feel so frustrated you know, try to focus on how the issue makes you feel, right? In other words, to say, you know what, I have a lot of anxiety about uh, that issue. So, you know, ultimately the goal is to commu keep communicating, right? And when people are attacked, obviously that shuts down communication. So that was a, that was a trick that uh, that we used on our farm. Okay, well, let me just move on then to the next roadblock that we're going to talk about here today. Uh, Patty and Maggie chose to pre-record this particular session. So what you're about to see uh, is the real deal, and it can become an issue for any farm business. This roadblock is about the loss of a key member of your team. So one of the roadblocks that we have discussed that can be a challenge for farm families is loss of a key farm member. And it just happens that one of our co-hosts, Maggie Van Camp, uh, can speak to that and is a farmer herself, which you may not know. So Maggie, thank you for doing this. Tell us about your farm. Um, Patty, I, uh, I have a chicken farm actually, Red Crest Farms. I have uh, about 30,000 broilers that we raise to 2.2K um, almost five or six times a year we do that. Um, so I live on a 100 acre farm, so we share crop that as well, and uh, I have a, a solar panel. Excellent. Uh, so then, uh, when did you start farming? Tell us a brief history. Um, we started farming in 2000. Um, yeah, I had a baby when we moved across the country and uh, started farming all in one month. Uh, <laughs> it was a big year. Um, we worked with my husband's family. Uh, he worked with his uh, with his family, and uh, I took care of the chickens and the kids. And uh, we did that, and paid off our debt for about five years. Uh, then we decided, to, you know, to go into more debt because that's what farmers do. So we bought a bigger farm, um, the farm where I'm on now, um, and we uh, we worked with his family toward a succession plan during that time frame. So. 
probably three years after that, after we moved there and built a new barn, we did a succession plan. So what did that look like? Uh, we we worked with my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law and uh, they are, were already incorporated. So we just sat around the table really and discussed the new shareholders agreement. And within that, we had to discuss the four Ds, which are uh, disagreement, disability, divorce, and death. And so those four Ds, that shareholders agreements that can anticipate some of the risks that a farm might encounter, uh, it talks about what you would do in those cases and gives a bit of a map, which became pretty important for your family. Oh yeah, um, in fact, I would say that's why I'm so passionate about succession planning. Um, we had a pathway through it because we had a shareholders agreement when uh, my husband passed away uh, about eight years ago on a farm accident. So just like that, everything's overwhelming. We're just like, could hardly breathe. Um, but at least we had this kind of guide through what we had to do um, after his death because of the shareholders agreement. Absolutely. I think it's kind of a little known fact that shareholders agreements um, address how you get into the business, but also how you get out. And so, um, especially in times of, of high stress, which I, I respect it must have been for you. Uh, I believe you also had wills. Can you tell us about that? Uh, we did have a will um, and uh, it worked. So that's the good news. Um, <laughs> the bad news is that after we had done our shareholders agreements, we knew we had to do uh, a new will to update it with this information uh, in case both of us had passed away. And uh, we put it off. Typical, everything in the farm gets in the way. Um, and we put it off, put it off, put it off. And then, um, actually, I was writing an article for Country Guide that was by Jolene Brown I had interviewed. And it was, If You Die Today. And um, it was, my husband read it and went, oh my goodness. And uh, and I went, oh my goodness, because we talked about it. And uh, so we we made he, we made an appointment with our lawyer to to set up a new set up a new will, and uh, had met with her. And um, when I went to write uh, his obituary, <laughs> excuse me, a few days later, um, uh, I sat down at my uh, inbox, and um, this will came through. Uh, it was a draft for us to sign, and uh, I just sat there and stared at it on my screen. I believe that. I think that in our conversations, something else that was a product of having to write that article and revisiting your will was a really important car ride. Um, was it to or from the lawyers? Back from, actually, <laughs> yeah. So we've gone up to the lawyer to to talk about this will. And on the way back, I did what Jolene Brown said, and I um, had a full scalp, locked to the doors to the pickup truck and off we drove <laughs> half an hour. And, and uh, you know, her question was very much about funerals and which we never got to, but um, I basically, we talked about, and I wrote down, you know, what would you like the farm to look like if one of the key people passed away? So what would you like if your father passed away? He was in his eighties, um, you know, what? What should the farm look like? What would we have to do? What would it look like without me there? What would we have to do? Um, and so we had this conversation about him and his brother and um, and I wrote it down and it was really just scribbles on a piece of paper, Patty. It was not, it was not anything organized. And when we got home, I just stuck it in the file beside, you know, our will documents. And I never thought about it again until we were going through all this and I used that. I pulled it out and I just, for some reason really attached to that because um, you know you don't know what that person would have really liked and wanted um, so it helped me to sort of think at least we had this document. It became a bit of a cornerstone in terms of that path as well. Yeah a touchstone for sure. So we've talked about the shareholders agreement being key, the wills that you had and the conversations you had. Uh, tell me about the relationships I think about community and professionals. Two key, um, having the people in place is so important. I can't even tell you uh, that my friends basically carried me for <laughs> for months. Uh, our community carried us. They actually they milked the cows at the dairy farm for 
uh, over a month. Um, we we were just overwhelmed with food and support, uh, but I also had some key advisors that I was very uh, was very lucky to be able to know them personally. So, um, you know, I knew the lawyer, I knew the accountant, I knew our financial planner, I knew our banker uh, one on one before this happened, and they all came through for me and, and with spades. Like they, I knew I could trust them. <clears throat> they uh, made sure I was aware and kept on the on the correct path. Um, in fact, I met with the banker and uh, I was no, so nervous about this because I kept thinking I was screwing up, like constantly kept thinking that I'm I'm messing up. And uh, I remember this call and I said, Michelle, I can't, you know, I, I do you, what do you need? We got to keep going. We had chickens in the barn. And she said, don't worry about it. We'll just do in the regular review in, in June. Don't don't worry about it now. We'll just talk about it in June. And that was just the vote of confidence I needed. Good. Center, I think people maybe underestimate the impact they can have in that moment. So that was a big deal. It was. So as much as there was some really good things that happened and some good choices and some good guides to do that, uh, there are some things that maybe you feel like you didn't do well. So can you comment on that? There's lots I didn't do. <laughs> I mean, I felt like every day I was not doing something well, uh, but we still did it. Like we were still able to put that foot in front of one foot in front of another. Um, it really helped for me to do chores every day. Um, I, I just felt I was in control a little bit uh, there and it gave me some space and some quiet time for myself. Um, and after all the all the paperwork was done, like this takes a long time, takes months, 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 months. And uh, a friend of mine introduced me to a woman called Angie Fox, who's a rancher from Manitoba who lost her husband in a farm accident as well. Strangely, a uh, very similar circumstance and uh, round around Christmas time as well. So just, you know, we had a lot of alignments and we had this conversation. And we just started talking about all the stuff we had to do, like all the paperwork, all the things that went wrong and all the things we didn't know um, that we wish we had asked. And um, Angie and her sort of awesome, <laughs> awesome, pragmatic way said, yeah, we could write a list. We could call it the get your crap in order list. And I started, <laughs> it made me laugh. Um, and I, I said goodbye and um, I put the phone down and slept on it that night and woke up the next morning and I thought, wow, we could do something called the Because I Love You list. And that's what uh, Angie and I created. And um, and now you can actually find it um, online. It's a digital version now. Um, you can find it at loft32.ca and it basically goes through um, like things like passwords. Um, it's like, where are the deeds to this? Who are your, your professionals and what are their contacts? What insurance policies do you have? Things like that. Absolutely. I uh, I have a lot of admiration that because I love you, Liz, is the way that I actually first came to know you, I think. And and at the time, I was like, that's such foresight, but also like out of, of hardship, how might I help others? And so I just, I'm really proud of you and, and really have such a respect for you choosing to help others um, in your situation. It, it's pretty exciting. The one thing I've learned in this is that one way to heal is is to help. And um, it was very cathartic to hear the stories of people that this has helped, you know, from a McGill student who lost her dad and had filled out this form to, uh, you know, another widow that um, I got to meet after this that had done some of this with her husband. And so was a little better prepared. Absolutely. So while we don't wish this for people, it's a real risk. We're all mortal. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to recap the importance of the shareholder disagreement in terms of the path of what you would do in the case of such a such an occurrence, such a risk, that you have wills in place and that you've talked about them. Those conversations are a really key piece that goes together with your will. And then the relationships that you were able to lean on, but then how you rose and we're able to teach others. So thank you for that. This means a lot. I want everyone to get prepared as much as possible for the worst and then enjoy your life every single day. Well said. Thank you. You know, it's um, 
it's sort of easy to remain speechless after you hear about Maggie's story. Um, but you know what, we would be amiss to, to not unpack her story a little bit and learn the important lessons, some of the things that she learned. Uh, Maggie had taken steps, as you heard in that discussion beforehand, that I guess you could say acted like a bit of a compass in their time of loss. They mentioned that they had the shareholder agreements and they considered the, the four Ds, the death, divorce, disability, and disagreement. The will, the conversations about wishes, right? The, the what if I died today discussion. And of course, the relationships with community and professional advisors. Maggie also referred to, of course, the uh, because I love you list, which she has graciously agreed to share with us here today. And so I'm just checking the chat here. I don't see it there just yet, but you will find that because I love you list uh, in the chat today. So check it uh, periodically and certainly before you leave here today. So the other thing I guess I should mention is that hearing Maggie's story may stir a desire in some of you to share your personal story of grief or loss. And, and as we thought about this, we felt, you know, rather than do that, uh, we believe there's much more benefit that you will, uh, that you would gain if you share your story with your family or with your team. Also, if you're struggling a little bit with some of this, with some emotions, with some loss, I encourage you to just don't hold it all inside. Reach out, connect with a trusted confidant, with a doctor, uh, with a, a professional counselor. I'll bring uh, Patty uh, back into the discussion a little bit now. Um, Patty, by the way, nicely handled interview, uh, very, very well handled. Um, I have seen the Because I Love You list. Uh, I had a look at it on the Loft32 website. How would you describe the value of this list for those that are making important decisions while grieving loss? I think that we underestimate the critical pieces of information that one person in your farm business knows. And by going through that list, if you can document those simple things, it can really equip someone who is in um, that state of grief that you're describing. And so while we don't wish it, every one of us is mortal. We have this opportunity yeah. to give this gift and share this information. You don't have to know every answer. You have to know where to find it. And we can yeah. offer that and encourage that. And uh, I am, I'm a huge advocate and, and, uh, and will continue to be so because it needs to be talked about because we, uh, we can give this gift to each other. Yeah, in, in, in really simple terms, it's, it's really just the gift of certainty. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you know what the person wanted, you know where things are, and, and it's, it's a gift to those people who have to do logical things in an extremely illogical uh, time. Okay, Patty, well, you're, let's you're, change. You're plan, plan, oh, I'll say, you're planning for the worst, yeah. you're hoping for the best. We hope this is a yeah. document you never need. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Okay, Patty, you've got our next roadblock. Tee it up for us here. I sure do. So roadblock number three, uh, as we were preparing for this and thinking about farm families that we've met with, we certainly think about um, understanding your financial position and capacity or lack of understanding of financial capacity. So um, how do you understand where you're at, how good it is, how bad it is, and how can you monitor it? And if you don't already monitor it and keep really good records, how might you get to that point um, we were very lucky to have Maggie spend some time with Colin Penner, a farmer in Southern Manitoba, and he's going to share his farm financial story and some of the lessons that he's learned. One of the biggest challenges to succession and one of the largest roadblocks is financial capacity and understanding your financials as well. So today uh, I'm having a little visit with Colin Penner. Uh, he farms in Southern Manitoba with his dad and his in-laws and his brother. And today, and also Colin also teaches at the University of Manitoba. So he helps um, ag students there develop business plans to go back onto the farm. And so he's got lots of experience, both personally and scholastically. Hi, hi, Colin. Hi, Maggie, it's good to be here. Great, well, thank you for joining me. And 
I just want you to sort of give us a, a little broadband spectrum of what your farm looks like today. You've been farming about what, 13 years? Yeah. Yeah, lucky number 13. And uh, so we had a record drought this year. So that's, I think, lucky number 13. But yeah, our farm, uh, it's its definitely changed over the years. Um, we're doubled in size um, from what when, when, when I started. And so our farm, it, it from the outside, it looks like a farm, but in fact, it's four entities. There's my dad's corporation, my corporation. We have a joint venture between the two of us. And then um, my brother, he's a sole proprietor and, and my brother's just joined the farm. Well, he's been back on the farm full time now for almost a year. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, what would you do? Uh, what do you know now, especially financially? Uh, what do you wish you knew back when you started farming? I wish I knew that numbers weren't so scary. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. when, I, when I first started farming, you know, I had an opportunity to buy the neighbor's farm down the road for like nothing now, looking back on it. And, but it was, you know, $320,000 and, and it looked, it was just a scary number. And I wish that I would have spent more time looking at that now saying $320,000, I can make that work and, and running the numbers and just focusing on what do my budgets say? Um, you know, am I able to cash flow this and make this work? So debt is a huge part of that. And yeah. so what on your, um, how do you view debt now? And what, what key numbers do you follow and ratios do you follow now um, around debt? Well, when I first started farming, I saw debt as, you know, great. I can buy whatever I want. That's, that's sort of how I saw it. Um, you know, kind of like kid mentality, go to the candy store. Now I see debt more as uh, it's a tool and I think it's an important tool to utilize. Um, but I'm my goal in, with debt is is changed over the years, and so I'm not there yet. But I would like very much to be using debt to make capital purchases on like just on land, and then be able to use my working capital and cash to buy equipment. Um, that, that's one of my goals, but I, I'm working towards that. Having debt goals is a really interesting thing because most people um, don't actually put some intentful thought to that. So it's really interesting. One other interesting thing about your farm is that you actually have two different succession plans in place because you farm with your your father and mom, Cal and Gloria, and, and your in-laws. So can you kind of explain what the two different succession plans are? Yeah, well, I think they're very different and probably one's more a uh, succession plan and the other one's more of an estate plan. Um, so with my in-laws, they retired six, seven years ago now, and they sort of said, okay, we're done farming, we're moving to the lake, we're out of here. How much of the farm do you want? And uh, at that point, it's, it was I was blown away. Um, but so we, we ended up renting a good chunk of my in-laws' land, um, buying some key pieces of equipment from them. Um, they financed us, so it, it's been pretty phenomenal that way. Um, but the estate plan with them is when they pass away, my wife will get half the farm and my sister-in-law get the other half of the farm. And uh, we do have a life insurance policy that they were generous enough to um, pass on to us when they retired they said hey this is going to lapse you can keep paying it if you want so the goal is to when when they pass away we'll buy my sister-in-law out and we'll own their farm outright which i mean it's it's not looking back at it it, it was frustrating and not ideal but it's been a tremendous um tool for us to have this additional acres so that our farm could grow in size so that we can make you know make a few bigger purchases and just to have, be a little bit more independent from my dad and, and their operation. And so with my parents, the, the succession plan with them, it's it's evolving and it's changing over the years. And I think we're seeing, we're coming up closer to the day when it's gonna be, this is in fact what's happening. And so originally kind of what happened and what the plan was, was as mom and dad decided to slow down, we would pick up some more of their land, we would buy it from them, we would, um, you know, use their equipment as uh, a down payment or a trade-in value on equipment so that I would kind of continue growing the farm and they would kind of slow down and, and we would kind of do this together. And and we did a little bit of that. And then my brother said, hey, I want to come home and farm. And uh, I think, I hope maybe he saw that we were having fun. And so he decided he wants to join in. Um, so it, it really, it messed things up. And it, it really took a succession plan that was, it wasn't hard and fast, but we were, you know, we were slowly working at it. 
and we said, wait a minute, we need to stop, we need to reevaluate. And so the succession plan really has been put on hold for the last, you know, four or five years. Well, you know, we figure out, you know, at, how is it going to look for my brother to come home to the farm and to farm with us? And so we had a, a meeting a few days ago, well, a couple of weeks ago, I guess now. And it was, you know, starting the conversation up again. And because now there's two brothers farming together, it's just a different levels of complexity. And uh, we're working at it. Um, I think dad said he, he said he's wanting to retire at 65. So we're, that's coming up every year it's coming up a little quicker so uh we're we're working at that more just so that when dad turns 65 next year we, we've got something in place that it's we're rolling with cool actually your dad setting a goal like that is actually amazing because not too many people do put a hard fast okay i want to and this is what it's going to look like when i retire so that's yeah. that's huge for you guys one of the things you talked about was um having entities so i understand you have four farm entities how did that play into developing compensation um, and and ownership and and how you manage like how how does that work <laughs> tricky um but i mean every farm's tricky and every farm's complicated right yeah. so i uh, when dad first started farming he farmed with his dad and then they incorporated when my grandpa retired and so when i came home and i said okay i want to farm dad said okay we can do this, but he, he rented me 80 acres. And so I was a sole proprietor. He was the, his farm. He was a yeah. corporation. And then, you know, as my sole proprietorship grew, me and my wife incorporated. And so we're two corporations now. And then there was an opportunity to farm more land. So, um, and it was too much for me to handle at that time or us to handle at the time. So my dad stepped in and we started a joint venture between the two of us on, on these acres. And so the joint venture is 50, 50. And um, it'll be wrapping up shortly. And then when my brother decided he wanted to come home and farm, he started up as a sole proprietor. And so we're, yeah, four entities. We run one set of equipment with very mixed ownership. I mean, I own, you know, 46 point whatever percent of our four-wheel drive. And it's it's complicated and it's messy, but it's been, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's been a chance. It's given us an opportunity for us to learn on our own in our own business and make our own mistakes, have our own successes, mm -hmm. and and work together. And so compensation is is sort of decided on how, yeah, with, by each individual. I mean, when I first started farming with my dad, it was my dad didn't pay me. It was you can use my equipment for an hour, and then you got to work ten hours for me. And uh, that's we're, I'm still working that off now, thirteen years down the road. But um, it's it's one of those things where we're working together and we want it all of us we want to see success for everyone and so it's not um yeah we're not pushing to get my stuff done it's what's best for the farm nice well it's true it, it's uh if your parents can say we want it to be successful uh everyone involved to be successful uh that's a, that's a great starting place um I want to kind of ask you a little bit more about your your experiences at University of Manitoba. Um, you help students build business plans. You help them sort of understand farm financials. Um, how do you tell, or how do they tell, and you teach them how to tell, if their farm has the capacity to take on a next generation? What are some key numbers in there? Well, I mean, r ratios are kind of scary when you look at them. They're, they're just, you know, you look at it and you're not sure what's going on. So. With the students, we, we try to teach them about the different financial ratios, but probably the, the biggest one that we look at as sort of a, a general indicator is, is the net farm income on an accrual mm -hmm. basis. Um, the, it, doing it on an accrual basis gives you the opportunity to say, okay, this is what we made this year. These are our costs. This is how much money we've earned or how much money we've lost. And so I, I know one year snapshot as you, at your net farm income doesn't really give you a good indicator, but it's... It's a way to start looking at it and saying, you know, is there enough capacity for us to, you know, bring someone up on the farm? Um, I know we look at what does it cost you to earn a dollar, and so you know, some operations where you know it's costing you sixty or seventy cents to earn a dollar, there's a lot of room for the next generation to come in. Um, other operations where it's costing you, you know, ninety-five or ninety-eight cents to make a dollar, it, it's a little trickier to to come home and farm like that. So. Um, it, it is kind of a, a moving target because I do think the next generation coming in can bring some unique ideas and good ideas to the farm. And, you know, sometimes maybe we can, as the next generation, bring our 
you know, 98 cents to make a dollar, bring it down to 90 cents to make a dollar or, you know, try to hit, you know, the industry a target where it's, you know, 75 ish cents to make a dollar. And uh, it's, so it's, but it is looking at all the ratios at the same time, kind of, it, it paints a picture for the farm, but it, it does take a little bit of time to understand what the ratios mean and, and what they are doing for your farm. Has, has that changed over the years, Colin? You know, you've been teaching there for quite some time. Um, like has that as the assets have gotten more and more expensive, has that changed what you look at, or like has that attitude shifted there? Yeah, I, I think so. I th and it depends on on every farm, right? Like if we look at our, you know, some some ratios like your return to your capital. I mean, farms because land is so expensive, it's impossible to really have a good return on capital. Um, mm -hmm. But to lean that down also makes you vulnerable vulnerable too. As a farmer right you don't own a lot of assets and so it's i think i would say net farm income is a huge one um working capital is another important one you need to have cash in order to pay bills um debt service ratio are you able to pay for your debt that you've got i mean that that's the one that i look at for for my own self i, I you know I, I i i modified it for myself i you know i want to look at what my loan payments are what my rent, land rent is and my land taxes are. And sort of, you know, I've got a number of figure there that I like to kind of, um, you know, try to target when I'm acquiring new land or if I'm, you know, deciding I want to get rid of an asset or something. Um, that's, you know, those are different things that I look at. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing those insights today. Really appreciate it, Colin. Is there any other words of advice you give to new farmers starting out there? Um, you know, things that you, you've learned over the years that um, you'd like to share? Yeah, well, I think one, be patient. Um, it's so easy to just get rammy and just try to shove things through. That's not always the best way to do it. And I think the other thing I wanna say is get involved in farm organizations or even just local boards. Um, so often there's other capable people and people that you're going to learn from at sitting around these board tables, um, you know, whether it's just the curling rink or, you know, there are people there that have different experiences and, and grab that information and run. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but, you know, find someone that's doing a good job and copy them. Thank you, Colin and Maggie. Great insights. Uh, I have to say that there can be uh, some terminology that he might have spoken to really casually because he works with it all the time, but it's an opportunity for everybody to improve their, their acumen from farm finance perspective. I really appreciate Colin's experience in terms of his willingness to pause and learn and adjust as the circumstances changed. You heard about a number of different things along um, business structure and um, business arrangement, depending on the particular position of everybody and who was involved. And just that patience in the process, um, all of those things happened in just 13 years. There was a lot of shifting and I think that's a really big deal. Um, he shared some specific ratios that he considers kind of his dashboard that he pays attention to and allows him to uh, base his decisions on. Uh, I'm curious if, if anybody in the audience has other key numbers or ratios that they're monitoring on a regular basis. Um, please share that in the chat, um, things that you find to be really helpful. I know from talking to um, some uh, farmers, they don't, uh, some are not necessarily monitoring it as closely and some are monitoring it quite closely. So I think wherever you are in that spectrum, uh, what are you doing now and what would you like to improve would be interesting to hear. Something else that I think is really key in Colin's commentary is the fact that there's great evidence that he has fairly significant consistent record keeping over time. And one that was really interesting to me is that trade of equipment and labor with his dad. And he commented, and I still owe him, that number one, he recognizes he receives significant value and help from his dad and that it's being tracked over time. Uh, out of the, uh, 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 I think a desire to be generous and a desire to have a trusting relationship. Some of those things don't get tracked on farms and it kind of leaves people lacking because they don't necessarily have the tools to make good decisions. So in his case, because those records were kept, they could uh, reasonably arrange their joint venture. Um, they have his brother coming home to join the operation. He kind of joked about it wrecking the plan, but it's allowed them to pause and say, you know what, here's our current position. Here's where we want to be. Here's what my brother would like to participate in and it can really equip that conversation. 
again, because they've been keeping records. So I really want to highlight that and commend them for that because it is, uh, it takes effort and consistent work and it's a really big deal. So I also know that we are sharing um, a link to a BDO web conference that's coming up. And Kevin, if you want to join me here, uh, they are offering this free web conference and it's going to be providing further farm finance insights. And so uh, check out that link if that's something that if you feel like maybe that's a, um, an edge that you need to sharpen. Yeah, that's coming up uh, the end of the month, and I'm going to remind everybody about that actually just when we uh, when we wrap up in about 25 minutes or so. But yeah, that's good insight. And uh, uh, Maggie, are you nearby? We'll get to yeah, some of your thoughts here. Great. Well, today we talked about three different roadblocks uh, of transition planning. We talked about communication skills and communicating with your family. We talked about uh, financial knowledge and capacity, we talked about the loss of a key member of the farm. And of course, there's many, many more roadblocks that you may be encountering today, but those are the three ones that we focused on because we could actually give you some solutions and examples around those. Um, the farmers that, that we featured today <clears throat> didn't expect that any of those things to happen. They hadn't yeah. planned any of those things. And yet yeah. they were open to new solutions and ways of doing things. And, um, you know, they kept the goal still in their, in their eyes and in their heart and used their mind to find new ways to get, get to where they needed to be. Kevin, what did you learn from these roadblock busters? Yeah, you know, how much time do we have? <laughs> I, I do feel like there, there's so much here uh, that is worth pondering or emphasizing. You know, one of the pieces that I'm, I'm going to just bring it up again was, Maggie, your idea of the Because I Love You list. And this is partly the reason that resonated with me initially is because of our desire for our family when my parents were transitioning to just get some level of certainty of, of where things are and, and what they uh, wanted, you know. The other reason that resonated with me was I noticed on the FCC website an interview with you, Maggie, about your scenario. And, and in there, there's a short quote that you made that you said, uh, at first, shock made it nearly impossible to think clearly. And so, Maggie, I guess let me bring you in and ask you this question. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this question before as in the past and other contexts, but if you could go back, uh, first of all, if you had had access to such a thing as because I love you list, do you think it would have reduced some of your stress when thinking clearly was next to impossible? I think it would have given me answers all in one location that would have been very helpful. Um, not only for the farm business, but for the funeral planning, because we didn't do really any funeral planning. So that would have sort of given me some answers. You, you can't tell what somebody wants. In fact, my, my husband was a real joker and he said he wanted the Canadian brass to play at his funeral. That was the only <laughs> <laughs> So I'm calling in the middle of the night trying to find Canadian yeah. brass. Calling yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't do it. So it would be really helpful. Yeah who have had some directive around that um, going forward for sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing nice. I would tell myself would be that it's going to be okay because I really had yeah. a hard time believing that it's going to be okay. And I don't even think, I think that goes beyond grief part of this conversation, but also during succession yeah. planning, that it's going to be okay. Yeah. You can do this. Nice. Uh, we'll bring Patty into this conversation too. And while we do that, I'll just remind everyone that we do have a few moments here now for some Q&A. So you can pop your questions into the Q&A box there on the bottom, and we'll just get to as many as we can here in the next 20 minutes uh, or so. And just a reminder, just, I think you all know this, but just a reminder, you know, Patty and Maggie are not, uh, they're not lawyers, they're not accountants, so th that's not what we're here to focus on. We're really here to focus and learn from their experiences, and there is, quite frankly, a great deal to, uh, to learn there. Something else I have to say that when Maggie asked me about, you know, what I learned from this, what stands out for me is, is I, I had a chance to uh, chat with Leslie Kelly actually last week just to clarify a couple things and one of the things she clarified which was so cool 
was uh, how two of the concepts she mentions actually works together. So you remember I talked about briefly this idea of, uh, or, the, or her idea of the repair attempts. And she said the way repair attempts work, right? This is the, uh, this is the thing about addressing people's hurts and emotions and such. So she said the way repair attempts work is to use the idea of seeing uh, circumstances, seeing the farm, seeing issues through the eyes of other people, what keeps them up at night. And it's, it's interesting because she said through that process, we, it's amazing how we think everyone's gonna see things the same as we do. Like a, a new opportunity comes along that maybe will excite you and it just terrifies uh, me. And so she said that was, that was just a really eye-opening thing. So let me ask you this question. Another thing that Leslie said, which I think is interesting, she snuck it in really quick and it was almost missed, I think. She said, to do all these things without the phone in hand. <laughs> and, and maybe I'll start with Patty on this. Why do you think Leslie kind of snuck that in there? Like, what is it about giving your undivided attention or not that impacts family communication or any communication? I think it's a really big deal. I um, And I would say that I, I, I adhere to that same rule. So in a, in a family conversation that I might be part of with, uh, with one of our clients, um, I will comment, I can't compete with your phone. There's nothing I can do. Yeah. There's no juggling act. There's no dog and pony show that can compete with that technology. So we're gonna set these aside. We're gonna turn them off and we're gonna give each other our undivided attention because you really do have to listen. You really do have to see someone's face in terms of what their response is. And so um, I think we're all kind of have different levels of addiction to our technology, but uh, <laughs> it's about, it, it comes down to being about respect and communicating yeah. uh, with the person in front of you. Uh, just a reminder, by the way, we mentioned uh, a couple of things, the Because I Love You list and such that will be available in the chat and they are already in there. All as well, just so you know, you're going to receive a, 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 a post-event email, uh, I think in a day or two, and there will be a link to the Because I Love You list in there as well. A few questions have been coming in, and we, again, we encourage people to send those in. Uh, and actually, I'll, I'll just throw it out to both of you, and you guys can decide uh, which one want to tackle these. The question here is, what happens if we are not incorporated so that we can't have a shareholders agreement for the, the four Ds, right? The, the disability, death, divorce, and what was the other one? Death, divorce, disability, disagreement. Uh, so any other ideas on how they can leverage that idea without a shareholder agreement? Do you wanna take that one, Maggie? Yeah, um, you don't need to have a shareholders agreement to have a discussion about this or to have another agreement tied to, say, a joint venture or a partnership agreement. You can definitely get a legal uh, document that, that states what happens. Um, and, and I, in fact, highly recommend it, especially for the partnerships out there. Um, really, really important. So, no, it doesn't have to be a shareholders agreement that, in our case, um, we have a dairy farm with our family, which was a large cropping operation. So that was the additional, that was the, the farm, the main farm, and the chickens were separate. Um, so our chicken farm actually was not incorporated. So uh, that was one of the things that we talked about doing. Oh, I wish I had done that before Brian had passed away. It just would have made things so much more simple. But um, I did end up doing that, um, not right away, like my accountant suggested, but when I got my head a little bit clearer, I was able to, to set that up. So it's now incorporated. Something I'll just add to that is that um, a good description I've heard uh, by Andrea Argue, who is a lawyer from Swift Current, great last name for a lawyer. Anyway, she <laughs> <laughs> talks about um, ha having agreements, um, operating agreements relative to the structure that you've chosen. So it, it can be either just a, a operating agreement, a partnership agreement, a shareholders agreement, a joint venture agreement. Um, it's about having the rules of the sandbox. How do you get into the sandbox? How do you get out of the sandbox? And how are we going to get along while we're in it together? So here's a tricky question that uh, I think a lot of these questions actually are really good because I can just imagine, you know, uh, we had these questions, I imagine everyone does. So here's one for both of you, quite frankly, what breakthrough conversations help farm founders let go of control when they cannot imagine a new identity beyond being the main manager of a farm? 
have an idea. <laughs> I'm actually dealing with this myself. So it's, it's really okay. kind of an interesting time. I'm trying to get my head around this. Uh, and one of the little projects that I was told to do was to do two circles and put a line between them. And the first time, break out your time and what you do in the first pie. So, you know, how much time do you spend working on the firm? Hmm, 75 hours a week <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> a couple for, for an hour every week or whatever that breaks down to. And then try to imagine what you would look like retired um, and how much time you'd like to spend on each of those things when you're retired. So for some people, that means only working 40 hours a week. Um, you know, hmm. others might be working not at all. So it kind of was an interesting process to do. The way that I dub that is, um, how are you preparing to leave? So it's not about leaving right now, but what might that look like? So do you have um, some plans in mind that in terms of what's going to fill your time, but ultimately, are you absolutely committed to wanting to see this farm continue? And if that is the case, what will it take for it to be able to be successful when you are no longer here? And if that is the legacy you desire, that can really equip and have some good questions. And so asking the senior uh, generation, you know, if you want this farm to continue, if that's your passion, what will it take? How might we prepare for that? And um, planting those seeds, you might not get an answer right away, but it certainly is um, a way to generate thought. Right. And I think, too, one of the challenging things I remember Stephen Covey said in his uh, The Seven Habits of Effective uh, Leaders and Effective People, he, he, he talked about this idea of doing something with the, with the end, starting with the end in mind, which a lot of us, I think that's a hard thing to do, especially if you're starting out a career or just taking over the farm. Uh, but to, to begin with the end in, in mind, and so maybe that's a a means too of, of bringing up the conversation of, of even if we're partway through or near the end to say, how, how would you like this to, uh, uh, what is a win for you at the end of the day uh, with your farm and your, and your farm business? Well, and, and, and something else that Colin yeah. talked about, sorry, forgive me, that Colin talked yeah. about was that his dad has a specific date in mind. If you can mm. set a timeline and put a date on the calendar and say, okay, so we want to be able to be able to step back by, who knows, 2027. Saying that actually goes, oh, wait a mm. minute, like we got stuff to do. <laughs> and it creates yes. some urgency that everybody can get aligned to. Yeah. Partly too, it's a, it's a good process for every person to go through to actually, I think, review their actual identity. Like, uh, who am I, right? And is my ultimate goal in life to have this piece of dirt and and you know for it to be successful and stuff? Uh, and and my career, and I've had quite a few of them. It's been fairly varied. Is not really who I am. It's what I do. And so for me, my legacy are my three daughters and, and my wife. And, and I want the, you know, and so I think sometimes that process too can be helpful to garner that conversation to say, what is, what do you want your legacy honestly to be? So good, good questions there, I keep them coming. Here's another one and it's, it has some similarities to it. Uh, what happens if some of the farm family members are eager to plan and communicate and other members are not as willing? <laughs> so how <laughs> I know we're looking for quick fast answers here but there are none so uh, maybe we'll start with you Maggie if you have any thought on how do you just get that started having regular family meetings like Leslie Kelly said is so important because we all have to learn how to do this and we I mean farms used to be a single person decided what was going on and everybody else going along with it. And now suddenly you're trying to do this sort of collaborative decision making and it requires conversations and it requires professional conversation. Um, so I think having a regular meeting like that will, will help you. Um, I know my own family, I'm just gonna use us, throw my kids under the bus a little bit on this because we've been having family meetings once a year since my daughter was 13. We just do it every year. Um, and everybody gets to chair. <laughs> because what I found was one person talked a lot, and particularly it was me. <laughs> yeah. So I found once I got them to chair, it was a good teaching lesson uh, on how to do that. Um, but also it gave them all sort of the, okay, it's, it's good to say your opinion here. 
I would add that in those conversations, getting everybody focused on the same goal um, is a really critical success factor mm. because you're going to get resistance. Like, what is the point? Why are we doing this? Who cares? Right? So, yes, we want to transition this business. We want it to be successful and we want our family to survive it. And so, therefore, what will that take? So getting all in that ownership of that goal. And if you can't get there, then, you know, it's really hard to go very much further in terms of forcing it. But um, yeah. just saying like, why are, why are we doing this? Why are you putting in all this sweat and blood and tears? Um, what's, what's the point? And getting clear on everybody having the same point um, can be really powerful. And, and a similar question actually came in and, and uh, the angle is only slightly different where they're basically saying that the conversations aren't happening because uh, the, the key family members are the words uncomfortable and they want to avoid it. And so again, uh, how, how do you approach that whole idea? I think, first of all, we're all uncomfortable. Uh, you know, I think, so there's nothing special about that. So, but this whole thing of wanting to avoid it, maybe is the idea that the discussion, my discussion about succession for me mentally is just the first nail in my coffin. Is, is that, do you think, part of why I want to avoid it or people want to avoid it? Well, there's pieces of it. Go yeah. ahead, Maggie. Yeah, I don't think you can, I'm with Patty. I don't think we can make a broad stroke like that, Kevin. It, yeah, okay. Different. Some people are just shy. Um, some people mm -hmm. don't want to talk about this because it sounds, especially, it sounds like you're really greedy if you're meeting with your siblings and talking about this. It right. Come off like that. So there's a zillion different situations. So, okay. I'm not sure sure. that um, that helps 100%, but it does help in those cases to get a facilitator in to help you run the meetings um, and to have very separate meetings, one for operational, for, with the operational people there, um, have those meetings and do that consistently so that that's good communication that you learn how to do there. And then have maybe a family business meeting every couple of weeks to talk about numbers and sort of the management group around that and then a family meeting so kind of learn that there's different types of meetings with different types of people at it okay i think something a facilitator can add um or if someone is is one of the family members is kind of like doing research and checking things out is is developing some of the scripts some of the language around what's being asked for um mm. At the end of the day, often there's just expectations that are unspoken um, or unclear or have never been said out loud. And so just having that kind of blue sky conversation, okay, what are you expecting here? What are you hoping for? Where are you aiming? And um, that can maybe unearth some of those those hesitancies. But having a third party, and I the way I say it is without skin in the game, right? They uh, that aren't right. planning to come to Christmas dinner can be uh, really freeing. And if, if it's someone who does it professionally and those people are available in the industry, they can be really helpful because they do have the language around it. Now, this question may be a question for a lawyer, but you, you can advise if you have anything to add to this. The question is, how can a family consider requesting a prenuptial agreement with a son's partner before fully transitioning the farm to a son? So uh, it may be legal, but any, any thoughts on that at all? It's very legal. <laughs> okay. That's as legal as it gets. It's an emotional it's an emotional okay. conversation, right? So about that part, uh, I would say my experience with the younger generation is vast majority are like, yeah, accepting of a prenup agreement. They, they wouldn't have it any other yeah. way. So you're <laughs> better to do it then than try to do it later. I mean, do things when they're easy. Do those difficult things when they're easy. I can't repeat that loud enough. Do it when it's easy. <laughs> Not right. Difficult. I think what you're saying is do it when it's easy. <laughs> yeah. When you're not doing it. Yeah. So that, that actually is the principle of every agreement. You develop things when okay. you're in a time of harmony prior to reaching that conflict so that you have a tool to deal with that conflict at that time. 
The one thing yeah. I will say about prenuptial agreements, um, it is quite jurisdictionally unique. Um, provincial law is quite different across Canada. And so I would strongly recommend for you to consult with a lawyer in your actual province of residency to make sure that you're getting advice that matches the provincial laws to make sure that it's that it's valid. But I would agree with what Maggie said in terms of people understand the need to protect the tools of the business in order to protect the business and the family. Nice. It's also Here's protecting a, that daughter yeah. too. It's protecting okay. future grandchildren as well. And so it's it's not just well protecting farm assets. Well okay. said. This is a pragmatic question. Um, where do you store all your important stuff? You know, your deeds, your wills, your accounts, your PIN numbers, and, you know, bank account numbers. You just buy a safe and put it in the closet or what do you do with it? That's exactly what I do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Put it under password protection for sure. I mean, do not sure. leave this. I sure. Mean, for a long time, I had the because I live, because I love you list, right under my my um, computer. But I was using it every day. But it was not the safest place for sure. So, um, okay. Make sure you keep it someplace safe. But tell somebody where it is. <laughs> That, okay. That's the key. I said, like, it, as long as you have a safe, secure place, maybe it's at your lawyer's office, maybe it's at a trusted yeah. friend's house, if it's in the closet upstairs, whatever that answer is, but make sure that someone knows where it is. You don't have to know every answer. You have to know where to find it. Nice. So here are some just good practical questions that are quick answers. Uh, what's the best way to find a, find a farm transition facilitator? Where do you begin? <laughs> um, well, I, I happen to um, sp spend some time with a team that is, I would say, in, in early transition conversations. So um, FCC Advisory Services is, um, our team is certainly geared towards um, getting people started. I kind of joke that we grease wheels, we get people rolling in terms of those sure. conversations. There are professional um, facilitators that are available uh, across the country, um, some independent, some available through various um, accounting or legal firms. And so certainly check in your particular jurisdiction. Uh, the Canadian Association of Farm Advisors, uh, their website has a number of those uh, people listed, but I also would recommend talking to trusted peers and other farm uh, farm people that perhaps have had those resources. Who have you had a good experience with? Uh, would you recommend working with them? And I assume your answer would be partly the same. The question is, so where do you find legal experts to develop farm transition documents? So I, I suppose your answer would be the same. Okay. Yeah, Account. Yeah. No, I'm just going to jump in. All accountants work yeah. there, and uh, and and at BDO, we actually have a business transition services team that okay. do that kind of work. So I would start with your trusted accountant. They're going to be able to, you know, put you in the right direction. They're not going to be able to give you the whole solution. What they're going to give you is sort of the bottom part, the tax solution. And um, what we were talking about today is really the top of the funnel where all the sort of the emotional and conversations happen and uh, the accountants should be able to help you with the bottom part. Nice. I think uh, we probably got time for maybe one more question, maybe two. Uh, what happens, and this, these are never easy, and I don't know if we can do this quickly, but what happens, we had a family meeting and it went badly. How do we start again? Can I answer that one, Patty? Because it happened. To yeah. <laughs> Please. Okay. We did. Please, we yes. Meeting. We had a family meeting without a facilitator, and it ended up in yelling. We were, I was getting yelled at. And uh, it was a very uh, emotional thing. We thought we were doing the right thing. We didn't have any help. We didn't have, we didn't prepare at all. And I wish, I wish, wish, wish we had all been a little bit more prepared. Um, and uh, it actually stalled our succession for a long time. And in my case, I that as a, that duration as opportunity lost. What could we have done in that time frame? And uh, you know, you only have a given time in this on this earth. So make sure you still keep going if you can. And and I completely feel your pain, but get some help and make the next step. Something you can't okay. do yourself, knowing it's going to be a stressful conversation, is prepare a script ahead of time. Our brains tend to abandon shift, shift, ship when it gets a little stressful, and so that can help yeah. us to uh, be another tool for you. And ask questions. Okay. I'm just curious. Nice. Great question. Yeah. Good stuff. You know what? That's a great place to leave it. We are almost out of time, and uh, Patty, I guess I'll just I'll give you the final word today. I. Uh, 
I think it's really important that we thank uh, Leslie and Maggie and Colin for being really vulnerable and sharing their stories with us because out of some hardships and some challenges came some real success. They managed it by consistently making efforts, by asking for help and seeking advice and learning, and by not putting it off. There's ways around these unique challenges, and we know that you can do this, but it takes time. So on this Farm Transition Appreciation Day and this celebration, we are celebrating the hours that you're putting in, the time that you're putting in, the dirt that you're moving to get towards your successful farm transition. We are optimistic that uh, good things are happening and you don't have to do it alone. We're here to help. And so just keep on keeping on. You got this. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Patty. And uh, thank you, uh, all, all of you, and Patty and, and uh, Maggie, as well as Leslie and Colin for taking us on this journey today. My thanks to you folks at home for taking some time to uh, come along for the ride. Uh, just a reminder that if you registered in the days ahead, you are going to receive an email with a few links. One of them, as I mentioned, were the, the uh, Because I Love You list and some of the other resources mentioned today. You're going to receive in there a link to a recording of this particular event so you can re-watch it and uh, re-share it with folks. Uh, there will be a link as well to an evaluation of the event. Farm Credit Canada really values that, sort of like the breakfast of champions, because they need to know uh, what works and, and what uh, can be changed. And finally, there will be a link um, to register for the next virtual event, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, by Patty. On Tuesday, January 25th, the SEC Financial Gang will provide an economic outlook for the coming year and uh, what it means to you. So that is Tuesday, January the 25th. Same place, same station. So until then, on behalf of Farm Credit Canada, remember, we've heard some really cool stuff today, but for me, it's like I feel suddenly I have permission that I can be a dirt squirrel. Just get out there, scrounge around, get started. Thanks to Leslie for that term, terminology, by the way, because there's no style points. All that matters is what you do. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now and Happy New Year.